Hello and welcome to this episode of Talking About Rock. Here we bring you rock interviews from veteran and upcoming artists. We're always available wherever you get your podcasts on all the streaming services. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode. And follow us on our social media and our website, TalkingAboutRock.com. On this episode, we're speaking with veteran rock drummer Ron Rocco. From his time in the Rochester-based band Cheater to performing in Black Sheep with Lou Graham, then to hitting the skins in light years with Billy Sheehan, he has established himself as a force to be reckoned with. He has recorded for both Capitol and Chrysalis Records and is a member of the Buffalo Music Hall of Fame class of 1986. Up next, we chat with Ron Rocco on Talking About Rock. Okay, folks, let's welcome Ron Rocco to the show. Hello, Ron. How are you today? Doing great. How are you? Doing real well, man. Thanks for joining us, man. So going through your history here, you know, at a very early age, you were kind of drawn, I guess, to John Bonham's style I've been reading. And it's kind of what you kind of started with or kind of mimicked a little bit. Yeah, well, I did when I was younger, uh, both from a writing aspect, because I, I did write three songs or help write three songs on the Black Sheep album. And I played a little bit of guitar, not much, but uh, enough to write with. And um, in my mind, I had a, I didn't really want to copy any drummers. And I didn't really want to listen to the radio a lot, because I just really wanted to try to be as, as original as I could in my ideas. And um, I just could not avoid John Bonham. Right. Uh, it's just, it just, it just really hit home with me his style and that. So if there was anyone that I listened to or uh, patterned myself at, I have to admit it would be, it would be John Bonham. Yeah, and a, and a lot of drummers have, and he's probably one of the most renowned drummers there is. So why not? Of course. And I think that did you start out your first band as was that Rooster was your first band you put together or your first band you were in? That was the first band I was in. Uh, I remember that one. Um, it really did well for my first band. It wasn't my band. I joined it. And uh, as a matter of fact, the gentleman that was already, already in the band, um, drumming, um, I had an audition, was also the singer in the band, and he kind of wanted to drum and sing. And I went there with a cast on my arm up to my elbow, um, from my wrist to my elbow. I had shattered my thumb. And I love this line because I uh, some people, uh, the doctor said, you'll never play drums again. And uh, some people would agree with the doctor. No, I had, I had to throw that in. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, I had to cast all the way up to my forearm and I still won the audition. So I was thrilled about that, that I was able to, to do that and became the drummer in Rooster. And it was a very, very successful band for being a bunch of kids uh, just out of high school. We had a big tractor trailer pull up with all the money we saved and unloaded our first, in Rochester, the first 16 channel soundboard, all PV subsystem, four-way system. So we were the talk of the town and we were just kids. Excellent, excellent. So did you have a couple of bands in between before you moved into Black Sheep? I had a list of bands that all got out of the basement and did well. That is as long as this screen on this computer. <laughs> I wanna find it again because it was really incredible. These did not include any of the bands that weren't rock and didn't include any of the bands that were just, uh, that didn't really make it out of the rehearsal studio. This, uh, these were all bands that got out and got paid and played bars and some were in New York City, some were here, some were, spent most of my time in Rochester, but some in New York City. Um, uh, and the list is just a mile long. It, it's scary for me to look at because you know that the end is near, <laughs> you know, so to speak. Uh, it's just so many bands. I think there was something like 35 or 40 bands. Right, right. So, and you're honing your skills along the way. And then you then you met, did, did you meet up with Lou first? Or how, how did that kind of go when you got together with Black Sheep? What I'm going to give you here is something that a lot of people don't know. No, not many, maybe a handful I've told this story to. And this is the way it really went down. Lou Graham, we're gonna go back to the fourth grade. He was in the sixth grade. 
was playing the snare drum in the Star Spangled Banner. Many people don't know this, but Lou Graham was a very good drummer. Right, right. That's not, not known at all. And I and I think he, he influenced you a little bit with, with some of your kit, right? Not so much in my drumming, but he did influence me in my overall outlook about singing and playing drums. Uh, and I did look up to him and how he did that. Um, he had a style all his own playing and singing. He had very good hands. It wasn't so much his footwork, but his hands were really, really good. And um, so moving on now to the senior in high school, Lou Graham starts coming to my jobs. I'm playing in Rooster and he's coming. He was in Black Sheep. He was the drummer in Black Sheep. Right. And he's giving me thumbs up and I'm smiling at him. And it turns out he was looking for a drummer to replace him. Right. He's looking to step out from the kit. Right. Yeah. And that's how that all happened. And um, even though I've had an up and down relationship with Lou all my life, um, without him in my life, I would never have become a musician. Uh, I was highly doubtful that I would ever be what I've become today, which is uh, I've, I, a student of drumming, a student of music, a student of writing. Uh, that all happened because of Lou Graham. Yeah, just an amazing talent, obviously. I mean, we know the laundry list of, of hit songs. You can rattle them off that they came out uh, when he moved on to Foreigner you know, mm-hmm. after that, but, but you guys in Black Sheep, you must have had something special because you were signed uh, eventually to Chrysalis Records being the first American band on that label. So that had to be huge for you guys. You know, we had a, a producer that uh, Stuart Allen Love who um, came in one day and I think we were out in the barn and, or somewhere uh, rehearsing. Um, I remember a barn, but that was really the drummer that replaced me who had the, oh man, I think it was at Bruce's house, Bruce Turgens, that's what it was. And uh, we're out rehearsing or something and uh, Stuart came in, we're, we're leaving Chrysalis. And we're like, what? We're, we're from Gates, New York. You know, what do you mean we're leaving Chrysalis? <laughs> right, right. We're leaving Chrysalis and we're gonna go to Ca- Capitol Records. Oh, okay, and Be- Beatles were on Capitol, I'll, I'll do that, you know? Right, right. I didn't, yeah. have, much, I didn't was, have much to say about that any of that. definitely a step up. Chris Ellis was, was a very new company at the time, and I yeah. think eventually they signed Pat Benatar, but I think that was a little a little while later on. But we'll call Harem, Jethro Tull, yeah. uh, things like that. And we were the first American act, and a lot of people don't know that. So that's another claim to fame for the members of Black Sheep. Excellent, excellent. Well, I really love this stuff. We're going to take a quick break. We're actually going to check out a track and some video from Black Sheep for the track Woman. And we'll be right back here with Ron Rocco on Talking About Rock.
can smooth me, baby. What I wanna be is just your man. What I wanna be is your loving man. Oh, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna be your man, yeah. back here on talking about rock with uh ron rocco just checked out the track from black sheep so great stuff man you guys actually got some touring going on you guys toured with 10 years after ted nugent and um then you were slated to hop on the kiss tour but things kind of went off the rails there but what can you tell us about uh 10 years after and the nugent tours well 10 years after was the biggest thrill for me ever i was 21 years old and after after our show one night the drummer, um, Rick Lee, from uh, 10 years after, came into our dressing room, I think it was a locker room uh, at some facility, and started asking me to show him things on my hands and knees in my drum solo. 
and my head blew up right the size of the building. Uh, here's this guy from the first Woodstock asking me how to show him some of the things. And that really mushroomed up into him taking me out every night uh, in his limo. And his wife, Ruth Ann Lee, was on tour with him. And well, one night I was famous for being the band Clown, and I would smear food on my face to make the band laugh. <laughs> and they were all kind of rather serious. And uh, they used to call it the smears, and they'd cheer me on, and I would do it. Well, one night I just got done smearing coleslaw all over my face after a great set. And uh, I got the message that Rick and Ruth Ann Lee want to take me out on the town. Here I am stinking of coleslaw. coleslaw. <laughs> Right. Probably not the best to go out to well, yeah. wherever you're going to go, depending, I guess. But So I went around and Ruth Ann started saying she smelled coleslaw and I, I kept spirit. I, I didn't no. smell anything. No, um, you must be imagining it. <laughs> I went out and that mushroomed into Rick. We were playing some high lie arenas in Florida. And the, one of the f most fond memories I ever had was he and I had a practice set at the foot of his wife's bed. Um, Him asking me, slicks and me showing him almost everything I knew um and she was in bed sleeping sterling silver covering their food and, and I keep thinking about black sheep we're eating McDonald's and living living in one room shacks you know and right but then I realized that Rick was traveling around in a jet and I was traveling around in a Cadillac and a truck with no power steering and uh I wasn't looking too good um halfway through the tour and Rick was looking great I started to realize <laughs> excuse me that's uh this has to stop a little bit because I'm, go I'm going straight straight down in the visual department so uh, uh but it was great it was just great those memories and him pressing a button we go to a club and he'd press the button and and uh some chauffeur would show up and pick us up and people's hands would be all over the windshield and all you could see was hands and faces and you know we weren't used to that we were not the headliner right um, that had to be a big shock to all of a sudden to kind of be in the middle of all that with them. Yeah, I didn't make it huge. And Black Sheep didn't make it huge, but we had a taste of making it huge. Right. You know? And it fed that fire uh, for possibly for Lou to go on and possibly the other members of Black Sheep. Yeah, and then you did a tour with uh, Ted Nugent also. You did some shows with him as well, right? Ted was great. I have nothing but good things to say about Ted. Uh, the only member I, memory I have of that is being on stage while he was playing, sitting on the side and bags of pot were coming up. And um, he said, it's all yours, you can have it. You know, I don't want it. <laughs> and so my 18 year old guitar player, Don Mancuso, uh, he-, he likes, Yeah, we talked to him a little while ago, yeah. He likes smoking an occasional joint here and there. Right. And he was just like, it was Christmas for him. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, like I was saying earlier, you know, Black Sheep was originally slated to go on tour with Kiss, but I think you you guys had a kind of a falling out before that that opportunity came up. Is that right? No, no. Okay, I'm sorry, but it's really uh, not a falling out. Um, I never had any falling out except for one night with Lou directly, um, and uh, other than that, the band. I don't know the, the the way that happened. I think, and I wasn't part of the Kiss thing, so. I was, uh, as a matter of fact, the only date I did with Kiss Involved was at the Dome Arena with Lou's brother, Dickie, Richard Graham, uh, now. Um, and we were on the bill, and Black Sheep was, and Black Sheep came hobbling in in a smashed up truck. Right, right. That's when they had that bad accident on the thruway. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, I think that was around the time, maybe, that they picked up the Kiss tour. But I really can't comment, because... I wasn't really privy to everything that happened in forming the KISS tour. Yeah, what I've read about it is they were they were set and ready to go on the KISS tour. They were moving their equipment back from wherever on a, on a real icy roads. I think it was like on New Year's Eve or something like that. Yes. On the thruway. And yes. uh, and they had, an, had a major accident with the vehicle. You know, the vehicle, you know, got pretty crushed and ruined most of their equipment from what I've read. So they kind of... Put a kibosh, I think, on. That's more to, correct. To that's, more, that's what kind of, and I think the timing. I'm not sure about this, but I think that was around the time that um, Bud Prager contacted Lou 
uh, Lou Graham about auditioning for Foreigner, and the rest was history. Yeah, yeah. What I've read of reading his book at that time, he was really not sure what he wanted to do. He had a lot of loyalty to Black Sheep, and he didn't feel like he should leave these guys and go on to do that. And they were from what from what he wrote, you it was they were kind of like, you need to take this shot. You need to see what happens. You know, again, I wasn't right there for all of that. I was already out by that point. Right. I had had a falling out with Lou. Um, and, and a lot of people, you know, stick up for me and feel I should have been this and I should have been. And I tell everybody I got what I deserved. <laughs> whenever you whenever you tell a lead singer your thoughts as far as how a certain night went and you didn't approve of the way they led the band, you can expect to be either reprimanded or fired. So I have no qualm about what happened between Lou and I, you know, right. If I wasn't, if he felt I wasn't no longer towing the line, then that's, that's so be it. Um, so I have no problem with that. Um, right. But in the, in the early eighties, I mean, Buffalo and Rochester scenes after that were, were exploding all over the place with music. And you eventually, I think you, you formed a band with uh, Billy Sheehan light years in the eighties. Yeah. Again, um, Getting Bill into the band was a big part of my idea. I didn't form that band. Um, started out as Targa with a bass player named Jim Hall from Rochester. When we replaced Jim, it became um, Terra Nova. Excuse me. It became light years because I thought we should get Billy and we could pick up a following in both cities. And it really worked. Right. It really clicked. And Billy, I had Billy name it because... Um, I thought, you know, let the let the new guy have some have some say in what's going on here. And right. he did. He named it. And I, I think he really liked the band a lot. And, uh, and then after a while, um, Bill had gone through this a few times in his career. He was so stylized that he really didn't fit the project. And uh, I was nominated to tell Bill that the band wanted to try another bass player. It was not my idea to move on from Bill. But I saw the point. And I really believed in Billy, and uh, and I believed in Light Years. But, uh, I didn't believe in in that combination. And Bill and I have talked about this, and he says you really weren't kidding, were you? And I said, No, I've always believed in you. I just never believed in this being the right vehicle for you. It just wasn't the right fit for him at the right. time. Exactly. And as we know, he's he's gone on to do some some major things, you know, with David Lee Roth, with uh, Mr. Big. Uh, lot, lots of different stuff, uh, winery dogs and and some some Talus reunion stuff. And hopefully we'll see some more Talus stuff coming up with him in the future. If you're uh, around December 6th, I'm going to be playing with Bill um, here in Buffalo. Uh, it's, I'll probably only be doing a couple songs, but it's a Christmas thing that he does every year. And uh, I am I couldn't do it last year because of a commitment. And I was thrilled when I got the call again uh, to, to, to do it. And um, this year. It's an honor, you know, and um, just uh, that he thinks about his friends, you know. I yeah. think it's a good thing. And so uh, December 6th, I'm not sure the venue right now. I think uh, it's going to be maybe Babeville, maybe. Um, it's usually been at the stage. The right. Last years. It uh, is, yeah. In Williamsville, right. Um, so it's usually at the stage. Um, and uh, probably will be again this year. And I'm, I'm excited about doing it. Yeah, yeah. I've been to the last couple of years and, it, and it's always great. Always a lot of different folks come up there, you know, doing different tracks with, with Billy, Jesse, and Bobby oh, so LaBelle. It it's yeah. Jesse, yes, and Bobby LaBelle, yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, lo I love seeing that around the holidays and uh, everybody gets a chance to catch up with them because obviously Billy's in Nashville and stuff. So it's always, always a great show. So, so tell us how the transition went. So, after that, did you have a couple more acts or did that transition into Cheater somehow? Cheater was right after Light Years. Um, this is a funny story. It really is funny because these guys were young and um, they came to see me play at an outdoor concert. And for some reason, which I never wear all white, I was all in white. And I had sliced my finger open oh. on a cymbal and it was bleeding pretty bad, but I just kept playing. And... Um, there was blood all over me and and these kids are seeing me and they're like one of them made the comment look at he's got blood all over me <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like that's how it is every night for me and which is <laughs> kind of funny uh when i think back on that and anyway uh the producer from black sheep or the engineer from black sheep ed sprig called me 
So Ron, I'm pretty much managing Grace Slick. Um, a lot of people don't know this either, but it never materialized. Uh, and you'd be great in the band. So he goes, the only catch is you've got to grab a gig for four months because it's not going to happen for four months. So then Cheater asked me and I said, look, guys, I got an offer with Grace Slick in four months. And they said, we don't care. If you can play with us for four months, we'll probably be able to get a better drummer after you join in the band. Um, I guess they assumed I had a track record and it would help to land a better drummer. Um, so I did it. And then I got the uh, phone call that everybody dreads that the guitar player from Gray Slick chose one of his best friends to play drums instead. It didn't right. pan out. And so uh, Cheetah was on fire. And I said, why not stay? I mean, they're young, but they're a great band. And uh, I decided to stay. Yeah, you guys really were positioned to break through with with Cheater and the song uh, Ten Cent Love Affair was was really big for you guys. You know, I'm really glad we're doing this interview because uh, you're asking a lot of questions that I've always wanted people to know about. And uh, one night, I feel a little I'm a little nervous speaking for everybody else because again, I was not an original member of Cheater. I was brought on in Cheater to help seal the deal. Um, uh, this was Jeff Costco and Blaine Pierce's, I think, uh, original idea. Constant, maybe Chris Brake as well, the original drummer. But anyway, um, what happened was we were playing a gig at Uncle Sam's on Walden. Yeah, which very huge, well known back in the day. <laughs> huge nightclub. Yeah, that's it's, where I saw Talis play for the first time when I was a y younger lad. <laughs> oh, it's just a beautiful place. And... Uh, we played just a sellout crowd and RCA records had come to see us. And somebody had mentioned something about the record being out already. And they said, pardon me. And I said, you've released 10 cent love affair on a local record. And they walked right back out. So that could be, that could be the reason that Ten right. cent, the band never happened. Uh, who knows? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, they thought they thought you already had your one hit or whatever, and they missed they missed right. the boat. Exactly right. Because back then it was it was a lot of singles driven before you would even talk about doing an album itself, and it's kind of back to that now. But yeah, it looks like they thought they had mixed missed the boat. But I think it's a great track, and we'll take one more quick break, and we'll check out the track from Cheetah for Ten Cent Love Affair. We'll be right back here with Ron, with Ron Rocco on talking about rock.
Okay, we're back here on Talking About Rock with uh, Ron Rocco. So, yeah, there was a great track from Cheater back in the day. Um, you moved on to some other stuff, and you, you did some stuff, I don't know, fairly recently with uh, The Shakes and Jeff Costco, right? Yeah, that's true. I, I have to say, out of all the recordings I've ever done in my whole life, I'm probably the most proud of The Shakes uh, album. It was produced by... Uh, this is something I don't think a lot of people know, but it was produced by Jeff Tyzik, who was the horn player for Truck Manjon, who won a Grammy for producing the Doc Severson Tonight Show Band. Oh, yeah. So Excellent. that's a nice thing for people to know out there. And um, yeah, Jeff had a great voice. They were an R&B project. They were rhythm and blues all the way. But I said, why are you calling me? I'm not an R&B drummer. I can play it, but... Right. They said, we don't want an R&B drummer. They wanted it to have a rock edge to it. And if I can tell anyone to get a copy of the Shakes album, it's truly a great record. It really is. Um, I'm very proud of it. I didn't write anything on that, but I feel like I was a big part of the rhythm section there with my dear friend Ralph Ortiz and Jimmy Richmond and... Uh, uh, Ralph was just a master bass player, Steve Lyons, and Jeff Costco. Um, Jeff has got a phenomenal voice, he always has. Um, but uh, the way that came together, uh, it was really signed not to a label, but by some businessmen. Well, apparently, and I hope I get this right, this is what was told to me. So if it's not true, I'm sorry. But I was told that these businessmen got busted before the release. Uh, by, for selling satellites to Libya. Really? <laughs> yes. Oh, oh. So, um, you know, there were boxes of the Shake CD sitting in a warehouse. Um, I think Jeff sells some of them online now. I think if you go to jeffcosco.com or just look up Jeff Costco, you could probably uh, find a way to buy all right. of the past recordings of of Cheater or anything Jeff sang on. He's still selling a lot of that that stuff. So um, definitely look them up and uh, make a purchase. Excellent, excellent. Well, we know you're also a member of the Buffalo Music Hall of Fame, inducted in 1986. So you've had quite the career, you know, quite the list of bands, quite the list of players. Different opportunities came up and different things happened. What, what's what's next for Ron Rocco? What, what are your plans next? What do you, what do you think you want to do? I'm just starting out. And what I mean by that is, I'm one of the few people that was lucky enough to do music for the first 40 years of their life. I then fell into a job that kept my weekends open, allowed me to play during the week uh, and finance my music uh, at Ingram Micro here in Buffalo. And I wanted a goal, my goal is to last there for one year. And I just finished my 31st year there and I'm done, I'm retired now. So I feel um, I'm going to start writing again. And I'm going to start not, not so much to get a record deal. I'm a realist, you know. Um, but I'm going to write again. Possibly somebody might buy a song from me and record it. But really just to do it, just to write. To see if I still have it. Because I, I was writing some pretty good hooks to, during my band Sound Scream. I had a girl singer named Dee, Dee Marie. Um, and... We had a big blowout and uh, she says, came into the store where I was, the music store where I was working and said, I'm not playing in bars with you ever again, but I still will do your originals. So <laughs> that was one of the best compliments I ever got about my writing. She was pretty mad at me, um, but she's like a sister to me now. We get along great. Excellent. But, yeah. So I, go ahead. I try to try to, I try to make all my relationships or as many as I can have a happy ending, you know, that's definitely definitely the way to do it. You have any advice for young young drummers out there starting out? Any career advice or musician advice? Maybe you could uh, pass along to them. I do, I really do. Um, as far as drumming goes, um, there's never been a better time to learn drums. There's so much great information being given away online. Not even needing an instructor, you can grab stuff online. You don't have to be a rich guy and afford music lessons to be a good drummer there's what i've been doing is all these licks that are out there that i like that i want to grab i fast forward them to my text 
And now when I go down to rehearse, I constantly have nothing but what I like to rehearse with. I just go through the videos and I learn them and they show you slow, fast, medium, you know? Right. So that's one bit of thing that, 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 that I never had. I had a, you know, go to Hochstein school of music and uh, go as an underprivileged kid to get in there and try and get music lessons, you know? Um, but if you can find a good local uh, musician who has really got a good track record, sometimes it's good to take some lessons to, um, to get some of their, uh, their methodology, how they go about it. It helps uh, along with what you can find online. But the biggest thing is to stay inspired. Stay inspired. Yes, the record industry has taken a dive. There's no real record labels anymore. But think about what that means. That's really, in a way, a good thing. It means that the focus is now going to go back on the live performance. So you don't have to be a rich guy with elbows rubbing with a record label. You could be a band that has a great live show and aren't willing to go out there. I mean, that are willing to go out there and prove it and get signed that way. Or forget getting signed, just make enough money by doing live shows. So the opportunity is still there. Don't let it get you down. Excellent. Excellent. Yep. Well, definitely. We are always here supporting uh, local and live music and that's, that's the way we hope it stays. Ron Rocco, Ron, thank you so much for taking the time and chatting with us, man. Really appreciate it. My honor. My honor. Thank you for taking the time with me. I appreciate it. Yeah. And we'll see you December 6th and with the venue pending for the Christmas show with Billy Sheehan, Jesse Galante, Bobby LaBelle should be another great show. Thank you very much. Once again. All right. Have a good night.